Welcome to an episode of Professor and the Idiot in which we are live. We meaning me, Nick Wolfinger. And me, I, Amy Newberg. Wait, you're not Dalton. No, I'm the new idiot. I'm the brand new improved <laughs> idiot. Oh, I hope he doesn't mind my saying that. No, I don't think he'll take it personally to think he was the, you know, the unimproved idiot. He was the rough draft idiot. Right. He was the pa- he was the he was the the paving of the way yes. idiot. He yes. was the Promethean idiot. Indeed. Yeah. Yes, we stand on the shoulders of his idi- idioticity. Yes. So wait, why did you want to be an idiot, Amy? This originally I don't fucking know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dal- it was originally Dalton's idea uh, for a name, and I thought the name was great. Um, well, actually, I'll tell you, even before you and Dalton started doing this thing, I had been thinking about interviewing people. Um, my idea for a show uh, was finding people who do unusual things in life that kind of make the world turn that you don't think about very often and asking them detailed questions about what they do and why it's important. Or uh, um, asking people who know a lot about something really, really basic questions that most idiots and perhaps most people are just too embarrassed to ask because they're very basic. Like, um, where do babies come from? That Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> And I was thinking of calling it something like Idiot's Delight or something with the word idiot in it, giving myself permission to like get as basic as possible. And then it turned out you were doing this program with Dalton called The Professor and the Idiot. And I, I was very supportive of that. So once you lost Dalton, I was like, oh, 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 I'll be your new idiot. So here I am <laughs> fulfilling my, my dream. <laughs> well, thank you for your support. Yeah. God, if I had known that, I would have set up a Patreon page a long time ago. Is that how you say it? Patreon? Patreon? I don't know. Yeah. A Patreon. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Pat- Patreon. We. Oui. So, to quote Admiral Stockdale, who was famous as uh, the vice pres as Ross Perot's vice presidential pick, who said in the middle of his only debate. Who am I and what am I doing here? Uh, okay, that was a little labor. Wow. But he, okay. uh, yes, oh, he, yeah. I, I need to laugh when you're trying to be funny? Okay. It I, wasn't, it was too, okay. tor- it was too tortured and convoluted <laughs> to be funny. I, all right, okay. I'm laughing after all the right. fact. I ordered that stricken from okay. the record. Um, no, no, it was, it was awesome. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I am a PhD in sociology who's tenured for many years in a, interdisciplinary department with a funny sounding name at the University of Utah. I write books about marriage and divorce. Uh, I teach in Utah, but I live in California. Uh, As you've probably heard me say, it's a long commute, but I'm not that tall, so it's perfectly comfortable to fly. (laughs) Who are you? I am a musician. Um... Wow, I, I'm prepared. I'm an unprepared musician and an unemployed musician at the moment because we are in the middle of COVIDity. And I, I do sort of experimental, I call it access, accessible experimental music. It's fun. It's lyric-based, song-based. Um, it has a lot of sort of clever lyrics and bouncy rhythms, but I use unusual performance technology and a lot of sort of intricate creative ways of putting my songs together and I do a wide variety of of performances from this from a solo show with electronics to composing for ensembles to creating scores for modern dance to doing audio art uh, to collaborating with a number of different groups um, and the like but you're not totally unemployed now you have commissions right I do not at the moment have commissions okay. So I was commissioned last year to do a, a piece for a multi-channel space in, at Virginia Tech University, 140 speakers surrounding you. Um, so I've, I've been paid to create that piece, and it is all created, but, but the only way to hear it would have been to go to that space. So now I'm in the process during this COVID time of mixing it down to stereo, and I'm going to put it out as just something mere mortals can listen to. Shit, Amy, if I had known you were really unemployed, I'd be trying harder in this podcast. 
Oh, what, what, hoping to accomplish what? Hoping to monetize it. Oh. Ah. Uh, All right. Yeah, really? Can, <laughs> I mean, do people do that? Can you make money off of this? You can indeed make a lot of money off of it. Oh. Uh, if people listen to it, then you post ads and uh, then you make a lot of money. Uh, you know, Joe Rogan makes millions and millions of dollars with his podcast. Well, at the moment, it's it's not worth anything because we're in our experimental phase. So we'll, we'll, we're just glad if anybody listens and gives us some helpful and possibly positive feedback. Uh, when I recorded a punk rock 7-inch for Lookout Record in uh, 1991 and 92 uh, we took a long time in the studio to record five short punk rock songs and subsequently when i read uh, a book the memoirs of the founder of lookout records i learned that we were lookout's first record that uh did not generate a profit and that made me happy <laughs> That made me really fucking happy. Oh, you're a first. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. Fuck you. We didn't sell out like the rest of you. So, question about podcasts, because I know nothing, and that's my role, to know nothing. Why are they happening? What, what's, what's going on that everybody and his dog is doing a podcast? They're at home. But it was, doing, it was happening before, before this. Because any, anyone can do it. Uh, it takes very little very little startup costs. Uh, you don't really need much. You don't really don't need any special tech, although little tech makes it sound better. Uh, and anyone, everyone thinks they're interesting. I guess that's what it comes down to. It's sort of like the audio version of your Facebook page. It is. I, I, I like listening to the sound of my own voice, and I think other people will like it too. Yeah. I mean... It's not just podcasting. It's the whole, the whole state of of first name, last name, media brands, where everyone has a URL. That's their whole name. They have a Twitter feed, a podcast, uh, and if they can think of ways to monetize it, they do either by traffic to their their podcast page or donations to their patron page. And, and do you think that there's too much of this, the way there's now too much sort of bad music on the Internet? I don't think there's too much bad music on the Internet. Um, there's, I mean, there's always... Oh, okay, this is a whole nother discussion, but okay. Why is there too much? There's always been tons of bad music. And uh, now there's so much music on the Internet that there's music for every taste. Um, you know, there's music of Gopher singing Fra Frank Sinatra. Uh, there's just about everything. And so uh, that's good because you can find your bad music. And so you have to click through 20 songs to find one you like. What's wrong with that? We, we have lost any kind of... Um, how do I put this politely? We've lost gatekeepers. It, yes, we've lost, a, we've lost any, any semblance of a hierarchy, I guess. Um, I mean, there, I, I think we can all agree that there's some level of artistry that deserves more attention than some other level of artistry. And we don't have anybody separating those things. So somebody who's an absolute genius, you know, who the most talented person in the entire universe is mixed up on exactly the same level with someone who just sort of turned on his laptop with a microphone and screamed, you know? And there's always the off chance that that person who turned on his microphone and screamed is really good at is, it. Is is really good at it and yeah. goes viral. So yay for that person. Wait, no, I but I don't see the problem because the person who sucks isn't going to get a lot of page visits, downloads, won't get media, won't get media attention. They won't get to play shows where people actually pay money to hear their, their screaming. But the people who are good are not getting the media attention. We have to scream louder and louder and louder. You know, uh, it's, it's impossible to, 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 to stand out. Amy, here's a question uh, for you. Here's a quick question I ask constantly of everybody. How do you know that's true? Are you, are you looking for data or, or does, does anecdotal experience count? Hold on a second. Diet Coke, the official soda of this podcast. Uh, sure. Well, <laughs> you have to start something. You know, if in the absence of more systematic data, anecdote is a place to start. But uh, I 
still you cannot collect a, a representative sample of anecdotes. Um, I know it to be true based on the experiences of myself and pretty much every musician I know. But you only know musicians in one broad genre. Um, no, no, you, you're saying I only know like weird ass musicians? Weird, weird ass, I mean, you don't hang out with rock people, you don't hang out with hip hop people, you don't hang out with whatever the fuck the kids are listening to yes, nowadays. Yes, I think, I think rock people and hip hop people have it even worse. Because they have they have no individual voice with which to compete. They are so bound by their by the laws of their their genre that they're gonna and there's so many more of them trying to make it that they have even more trouble sticking out. At least in my in my field, you know, you, your creativity is is welcome. Your uniqueness is welcome. Uh, I still don't see this as a bad thing. I mean. I remember when I first recorded music, you had to actually pay to go to a studio uh, to make something, to make your demo tape. That, that's, that's one good thing. Anyone yeah. who has the proper technology can now put out a record. That's, yeah. That's and that technology is fairly... Right. And that's yeah. great for that person who otherwise couldn't make a record. Yeah. But it just, it just means that there's so much stuff out there and people are desperate to be heard and so they'll give away their stuff for free and the rest of us are obliged to give away our stuff for free okay. or to be heard. Okay, I think you're on, now you're on to something that's a problem that's more easily demonstrated or more, uh, more easily, uh, it's easier to write evidence for. Namely, there's, there's more competition and the competition drives prices downwards. And one concrete example I can give is, um, Pandora and all those other ones. Oh, yeah. yeah. I make a penny when you listen to me on Pandora. Ye fucking ha. Yeah. Case in point. Yeah. So what anyway, are we, we going to so, do? Wow, about? that was an interesting little tangent. Okay. What are we going to do about in this podcast? Well, uh, I had a few basic questions that we had discussed getting answered. And one of them was, um, I'm very curious about the deficit because suddenly... Well, all this money has appeared out of nowhere and many of us are wondering where it came from and <laughs> and and whom it is owed to yeah. and how it's going to be paid back yeah. and and why if suddenly all this money is available yeah. to everyone including the homeless and people who previously were ignored why if that money is suddenly available to those people wasn't it available before let me point, uh, interject a news item from today that was one of the weirdest ec bits of economic news ever. Yeah. Uh, the price of oil uh, was, oh, briefly yes. was briefly negative. They're paying people yeah. to take it away. Yeah. Yes, that's so funky. <laughs> yeah, we all waited too long to, to buy oil, but now right. is the time to fill up your bathtubs. So that was one thing that interested me during this time. And then I was thinking about other stuff that I know nothing about. Uh, another one was Parliament. So I think our, our first actual guest is going to be somebody who understands um, the parliamentary, whose specialty is European politics. Yes. Okay. Um, so there are no end to the number of interesting people to talk to. So there's tons of stuff uh, for us to cover. Yeah. So... One thing that this podcast, if you're one of the three people who listen to the old version and listen to uh, the professor and the idiot of The Force Awakens, is that uh, Amy is not Dalton and Dalton is not Amy, although Amy, Dalton's girlfriend is Amy, which could possibly lead to some confusion. A different Amy. Yeah. A di different Amy. And uh, so the... Certainly, the entire tone of the podcast has changed. So, to have the politics and the life experiences, Dalton self-identified as a libertarian. Nick has always been proud to call himself a liberal. And Amy is a... Oh, uh, I think I'm a, a socialist. Interesting. Well, okay, on OkCupid... Okay Way back in the day, yeah, when when that was one of the questions, where you where you, you you go through a series of, of questions and it tells you what you are at the end. Yeah, I came out socialist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you go to like 
training camps where you drill in firearms now, instruction? No, or... I just believe in the European socialist system. I think, <laughs> I think but that's, that's, where, I, that's that, where it's at. That will drive me nuts as it drove me nuts when, um, when uh, Bernie Sanders called himself a socialist in that tradition tradition that's not it's social democracy okay. it's okay not, so i'm i'm not using the right terminology i mean it's not you know socialism usually meant like collective ownership of the means of production well, and all what that. what do they call themselves in in denmark uh i think they just call themselves capitalists because ultimately they are i mean my i would call it social democracy just because right. the left parties there were always the social democrats but then fine i'll go with that yeah, I mean, I think I am, I am with you broadly. Uh, I suspect you are probably to my political left in some ways. I okay. remember arguing a few years ago. I could see some good arguments uh, for Obama launching a military strike on Syria, and you could not. Yes. Okay. Um, so I wasn't convinced he should, but I you, can you, certainly make you it. Are, yeah. You are more. You are more interested in guns than I am. Oh yes, I own guns. Amy hates guns. Yeah. Yeah, so I sure there are differences. Uh, we're certainly uh, of a similar age and a similar educational background, but we're from different parts of the country and come from, have different professions and have surrounded ourselves with different kinds of people over the years. So hopefully it won't be too bland. Right. We won't just agree with each other all the time. I don't agree with that. <laughs> Fuck that. We're not doing that. So in the weeks to come, you will hear from people, people who do different things. Uh, of course, if there's anyone, you three people who are listening would hope that we might talk to, please don't hesitate to contribute your suggestions. Uh, may I ask some things about you and what you do? Absolutely. Um, what is a sociologist? Uh that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it's a very broad field that uh, is interested in social behavior and the interaction between people and their social institutions, less interested than what's inside their heads, which is why we're not psychologists. Um, the founding figures were uh, usually treated as Karl Marx, uh, the French Emile Durkheim, who was the first to, person to actually hold a chair in sociology. Wait, and, Karl Marx? Yes. What does he have to do with sociology? Uh, what does he have to do? Because Karl Marx had a, had a whole theory of how th of of economic development and of of a, 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 a theory of political economy. What does pol political economy have to do with sociology? Uh, because. Karl Marx's theory should govern, you know, describes how d there are different social groups in society and how they should be competing with each other, right? How the how the interests of the of uh, the interests of the working class should be different from the interests of those who own capital, and how. So, so yeah. why? So why? Why is that about human behavior as opposed to about politics or government? Uh, because. It's ultimately, it's too much, <laughs> it's too wrong for modern economists <laughs> to consider. Uh, I, there, yes, there's certainly a lot of overlap between the social sciences and sociology, I think, has a weaker disciplinary mandate than either economics or political science does, or psychology for that matter. Uh, but there are plenty of studies that I think would be recognizably sociological. Uh, now I, you know, since I, Marx, uh, since communism was terrible every time it was tried, I would just assume uh, not have Karl Marx as a uh, given credit as a disciplinary founder. It's not pleasant reading Marx. It's Yeah, not, it's it, really yeah. surprising to me that he's the first person you listed as as sort of a, a, the grandfather of sociology. I, I wouldn't call him a grandfather, but he's certainly considered one of the dead white guys of the canon. He's certainly someone mm -hmm. you in most gets read in most introductory sociology classes. Huh. So there is an interesting uh, datum that's uh, 
treated as uh, as notorious that I hear a lot. It was collected in a study some sociologists did about 15 years ago on the political beliefs of American academics. And they produced the, the finding that one out of every five uh, sociologists in America identified politically as a Marxist. Huh. Now, obviously, this is used a lot by conservatives to disparage the discipline. And I find, yes, I know there really are some unreconstructed Marxists who somehow believe that even though they couldn't get it right in Cuba or the Soviet Union or Laos or North Korea or any of the other people's paradises, someday it would actually work. Um, and so I actually asked Neil Gross, the sociologist who did the study, what in the world he made of it? Because I certainly didn't think it was one-fifth that could one fifth of the profession sounded probably high. And here was his explanation was is that it wasn't that they actually were devoted socialists, but that Marxism was a system of analysis. And that made a lot more sense to uh, me. I see. And so that, that was the sort of model that they used. Yes, yeah. For, and so for doing their for for doing their work essentially. Right. Okay. And uh or just in how they they interpreted politics. And mm -hmm. uh, I certainly, I could certainly make a good case for that. Um, if well, that, that, then that brings up the obvious question of the people are going to use different models, then how do we know what is right? Uh, well, uh, you know, I could actually, I could, that the people who are wealthy uh, get their, get their policy preferences enacted into law more often than people who are not. So, yeah, if that makes me a Marxist to think that money drives a lot of politics, so be it. Now, there's actually... And Marx was the first person to come up with, with that way uh, of looking at I don't know if he was. I don't know if he was the first. I'm not very well read in, in, uh, in you know... Because I could have uh, written that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Mike Judge always said about Beavis and Butthead. He said, this looks like anyone could do it. And he said, yeah, but I did it first. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he was the first, but uh, he was the one people listened to. Okay, so what's something that you're working on now? I am working on a book on the changing economics of single motherhood. Uh, so I've written books about marriage and divorce. And certainly there is a lot of research on marriage and divorce that is recognizably sociological. In other words, it's not so interested in what psychological attributes predict divorce, but how interact, how things like uh, historical time and age and education can determine who stays married and who divorces. A lot of my work is along those lines. So certainly looking at the economics of, of divorce is a, sounds more like something economists would do, but Indeed, there have been plenty of sociologists who've worked in uh, who worked in this area, and I can give you a thumbnail since the book has been in progress for a while. Uh, Forty years ago, single mother families in America were five times as likely as two parent families to be poor. In two thousand and twenty, single mother families are five times as likely to be poor. How could that be over years in which women have now have more education than men and have tons of work experience? The book answers that question. And where do you get your information from? Uh, this book is based on the analysis of two national surveys. Um, the Census Bureau's current population survey. Wow, this is getting wonky. And uh, <laughs> Well, but I mean, it, it, yeah. it's just interesting to me where sociology fits into the sciences. Right. Is it a science? I think so. I treat it okay. as one. Okay. Now, um, there are certainly people who are doing uh, the kind of work I deplore. Uh, the term of art now is grievance studies, but sort of radical relativism. I send you some of those things, like the, the book jacket where uh, the, uh, the blurb was, is Vladimir Putin macho or is he a fag? <laughs> Oxford University Press published this. So yeah. for, the, for the record, Nick is often sending me the names of studies that are absolutely outrageous, yeah. that are real, actual, peer review studies. It's, it's, um, it's a whole genre. There's a Twitter account yeah. that has 
probably has 100,000 followers and all it does is tweet ridiculous studies. No. <laughs> So I guess ultimately I'm, I'm trying to understand around sociology, how you trust your data. Yes. And I mean, one, even in the real hard science sciences, as you know, you, you can collect data from different places that conflict with each other. And you can, you can have an idea in your head and kind of illustrate your own idea if you just find all the right data, right? So two answers to that. One is there are some subjects in which reasonable, smart people do disagree. But the second, which I think is much more the case, is that most science is terrible. Okay, Just that, as most music is terrible, most, that, most, right. science is, most science is, you know, not well done. Now, yeah. that's a real problem without institutional gatekeepers because, you know, the public can't tell the difference, right? Right. You know, and that's, that's why we have peer review and all right, that crap. Right. But still, the people report, people get anointed as experts by the media. Uh, we were watching John Oliver uh, the other night, and he had a clip mocking Fox News. And uh, they showed a clip on Fox News where someone was identified providing evidence on this bogus treatment for COVID. Uh, the guy was identified as a consultant to Stanford uh, medical school. Stanford Medical School quickly issued a statement that they didn't know who this guy was. So then I just out of curiosity, I googled his name and got no hits. Hmm. So he's just someone. He has no record of speaking on anything or publishing on anything or anything. I mean, it's really rare that you Google someone, you know, who isn't named John Smith and you get no hits. Yeah. I mean, you Google either of us and you get just zillion hits. Uh, well, well, that's the whole huge topic of the way we disseminate information right. in our bizarre media. Right. And what causes people to believe made up shit. I don't believe that. So, yeah. <laughs> huh. Okay. Wow. Is this interesting yet? I don't know. Uh, All right. <laughs> uh, we don't know, but that's why we're doing a podcast. <laughs> because All right. storage space on the internet is extremely cheap nowadays. Have we talked long enough? Yes, we have. Okay. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to the three people who are listening. And we will have a, a more guided and directed conversation next time we have a guest. We'll get better. I promise. Yeah. I'm pleading with you to stay for us. I, ne <laughs> I need this val val validation. I am an empty shell of a human being. I am nothing without your clicks. As we all are. Yes. All right. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening, listening to The, the Professor and the Idiot. idiot. If, if you, you like what you heard, heard go, go to Apple, Apple Podcasts and give us a good rating. Your positive feedback completes us. us.